You're listening to the Rauha, Daily Guidance for Seekers with Sheikh Faraz Rabbani, who will be covering Imam Yusuf al-Nabahani's beautiful collection of 40 sets of 40 hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, as well as Imam Zarnuji's guidance for seekers of knowledge regarding the ways of seeking knowledge. Ta'lim al-Muta'allim, Turuq al-Ta'allim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad. ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا رشدنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن الذين يتلونه حق تلاوته الحمد لله In our daily rawha we're looking at the third of the 40 hadith collections so beautifully compiled by Sheikh Yusuf and Nabahani, and this collection is on 40 hadiths on the virtues of the Qur'an, on, on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is meant to, of course, be a reminder to reconnect with the Qur'an. And today we're going to be looking, amongst the hadiths we look at, at the tremendousness of being busied by the Qur'an. And this is one of the great opportunities. And we'll be looking at some of the words of the ulama in what it means to be um, busied by the Qur'an. There is no greater remembrance than the Qur'an. There is no greater remembrance than the Qur'an. Right? Because what is the Qur'an? Right? The Qur'an is divine revelation. Right? It is divine revelation inspired to our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is mu'jiz. Right? That is inimitable. And it contains absolute guidance for those morally responsible, right? whose its recitation is an act of devotion and the greatest of acts of devotion. So these hadith should serve for us as a renewal of our commitment to recite the Qur'an on a regular basis, right? to, to recite the Qur'an on a regular basis and to strive to become min ahlil Qur'an. So we reached hadith number seven. Anil Musannifi rahimahullah ta'ala qal an Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu anna hu qal qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud May Allah be well pleased with him, relates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, من قرأ, ال... من قرأ حرفا من كتاب الله تعالى فله حسنة Whoever recites a single letter of the book of Allah, they have a good deed. والحسنة بعشرة أمثالها And a good deed is rewarded tenfold. لا أقول ألف لام ميم حرف. I do not say that ألف لام ميم is a letter because حرف can refers to a part. A حرف refers to a part of something. And of course, and so you, so you could translate it that they have for every part of it a good deed. And a good deed is rewarded tenfold. I do not say that alif la meem is a part, but rather alif is a part. Walakin, lakin, alif harf, walam harf, wa meem harf. I do not say that alif la meem is a part, literally a letter, but alif is a part, and lam is a part, and meem is a part. So every single letter that one recites the Quran. One has tenfold rewards for this. 
indicating, of course, the, the tremendousness of the reward. And this is the least of the reward, as we know from the hadiths of um, the reward. Allah magnifies the reward for whomever He wills. In the Sahih hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Messenger وسلم, tells us, الْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَىٰ سَبْعِمِئَةِ ضِعْفٍ A good deed is rewarded tenfold, up to seven hundred times. إِلَىٰ أَضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا To many times thereof. Even more than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there are people who are given أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ who are rewarded beyond measure and بِغَيْرِ hisab is either without measure right, that it is beyond measuring or it is so great that it is immeasurable right? and that you know and that applies to every single letter of the Quran but from it of course also one of the what's called and this hadith is related by Imam Al-Tirmidhi and it's hadith Hassan al-Sahih but you know the, the ulama understand Meanings that others pass over. One of the meanings understood from this hadith, and this is called Isharatun Nas, right? one of the indication um, allusions of the text, right? which is that if every letter has tenfold reward, then from the proper adab of the Quran would be to pay attention to every letter when one pronounces it. Right? Without takalluf, without excessiveness. And this is part of the great reward of tajweed, right? of proper recitation of the Qur'an, right? which is to give إِعْطَاءُ كُلِّ حَرَكَةٍ وَحَرْفٍ حَقَّهُ وَمُسْتَحَقَّهُ Which is to give every vowel and every letter its right and its due. Right? And to the extent that one does so, Soundly, without excessiveness, one magnifies one's reward. And the reward is magnified because its spiritual transformative impact is magnified. And this is a sound and rigorously authentic hadith, said Imam al -Tirmid. The next hadith, which is a hadith of uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, on Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qal, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى So this is a hadith Qudsi, that Allah Most High, Allah glorious and exalted is He, says, مَنْ شَغَلَهُ الْقُرْآنُ وَذِكْرِ عَمْ مَسْأَلَتِ أَعْطَيْتُهُ أَفْضَلَ مَا أُعْطِ السَّائِلِينَ Allah Most High says, whoever is busied by the Qur'an and my remembrance, from asking me, I give them the best of what I give those who ask. Whoever is busied by the Qur'an and by my remembrance from asking me. I give them the best of what I give those who ask. وَفَضْلُ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَلَامِ كَفَضْلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَلَى خَلْقِهِ رَاهُ التِّرْمِذِيُّ وَقَالَ حَدِيثٌ حَسَنٌ And the superiority of the speech of Allah, glorious and exalted, over all other speech, is like the superiority of Allah over His creation. There is no point of comparison. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ So from that is لَيْسَ كَكَلَامِهِ كَلَامٍ There is nothing like unto him, so there is no speech that can compare to his speech. So whoever is busied by the Qur'an from... Now this, this has come in narrations that mention whoever is busied by the Qur'an from, from, ask, from asking. And it's come whoever is busied by remembrance from asking. And some narrations have mentioned both together. Right? 
But here the context is with respect to the Qur'an, right? Whoever is busy by the Qur'an and remembrance of me in their recitation of the Qur'an. So this deserves some attention. One of the great scholars of, of, of the later ages, Mullah Ali Al-Qari, who was originally from Hirat, and many consider him actually the Mujaddid of, of, the, of the century he lived in. Um, and he lived in Mecca and was, a, was Hanafi, student of Ibn Hajar al-Haytami. And his, every book outside of fiqh that, that Ibn Hajar wrote in, in, in any subject, Mullah Ali al-Qari wrote a book in the same subject. And pretty much every other page, he attacks his teacher. <laughs> sort of the Afghani temperament coming out. And even treatises. Ibn Hajar wrote about intention. Mullah al Qari wrote a treatise on intention. Ibn Hajar wrote a treatise on um, ghiba. Mullah al Qari wrote a treatise on ghiba. Um, it's remarkable. Both have commentaries on the Shama'il. Both have commentaries on the Burda. Both have common. It's quite something else. So Mullah al-Qari makes a, a few important points regarding this hadith in its commentary um, that he wrote on Mishkat al-Masabih of Imam Tabrizi. So he says, firstly, right, that whoever is busied by the Qur'an, right, what does that refer to? Firstly, being busied by the Qur'an is by memorizing it. Okay. Or and learning its, its words. Right. And learning what it means. Or reflecting on the depths of its meanings. Or acting upon what is in it. So remember, whoever is busied by the Qur'an, whether in memorizing it, or in understanding it, or in reflecting upon it, or by acting what, on what is in it. And the most obvious one, of course, is reciting it. Well, that's the first, right? reciting it, or these four things. From asking me. So one of the important things here is that sometimes, and we've touched upon this before in another context, that sometimes when one has some difficulty or tribulation, one either doesn't know how to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things to do is busy yourself with the Qur'an, either reciting it or commit to memorize some part of it or to review that memorization, or read the translation and seek to understand it, or reflect on some verse, some verses in the Qur'an, right? listen to an exposition of something of the Qur'an. And this, of course, relates directly to the Qur'an itself, but the, the derivative sciences come from that. The derivative sciences come from that, fiqh and other things, but most directly and impactfully is with the Qur'an itself, of course. I grant them the best of what I grant those who ask. Right? I grant them. So, Mullah al-Qari says, so therefore, the one who is busied by the Qur'an, right? and so something happens, they discover that they have a grave medical condition. What do you do? You don't know what to, to, to do, what do you ask? A lot of times people get this itch. They say, okay, let me go and find out even more about it. You have an operation coming up. You're not going to do the operation. So finding out extra about it won't change things. Right? So you find out, but that's not what you should busy yourself with. Right? 
He said, let the one who busies themselves with the Qur'an not think that they didn't ask and th that therefore they won't be granted their needs, but rather that they will be granted in the most complete of granting. Because you, you are given by the giver, not by your asking. Uh, you're given by the giver. And Mullah Al-Qari here refers to the, the, the saying that مَنْ كَانَ لِلَّهِ كَانَ اللَّهُ لَهُ It's a beautiful principle supported by so many texts, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. مَنْ كَانَ لِلَّهِ كَانَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Whoever is for Allah, Allah is for them. Shaykh Abdul Ghani Nabulsi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he has a famous poem that begins, كُنْ مَعَ اللَّهِ تَرَى اللَّهَ معك. Be with Allah and you'll behold Allah with you. وَاتْرُكِ الْكُلَّ وَحَاذِرْ طَمَعَكْ And leave all other and beware of your avarice or your, your excessive wants. So it's a beautiful poem. Then he quotes something that we'll, we'll read this because what does it mean to be busy with the Quran? He quotes one of the great imams of the spiritual path of the early Muslims. He says, وَعَنِ الشَّيْخِ الْعَارِفِ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ إِبْنِ خَفِيف. So Ibn Khafif, رحمه الله تعالى said, شُغْلُ الْقُرْآنِ الْقِيَامُ بِوَاجِبَاتِهِ مِنْ إِقَامَةِ فَرَائِضِهِ وَلِجْتِنَاب عَنْ مَحَارِمِهِ Ibn Khafif said that being busy by the Qur'an is to fulfill what the Qur'an entails of establishing its obligations and avoiding its prohibitions. فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ إِذَا أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ ذَكَرَهُ وَإِنْ قَلَّتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَصَوْمُهُ For a person, if they enter into obedience of Allah, Allah remembers. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, remember, and I will remember you. And Ibn Khafif making an important Remembering Allah is not just to say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wa ilayna. That entering into a state of obedience of Allah is to remember Allah. Because that's a true remembrance. Because otherwise, you know, you're standing at, at the door of your master and I say, I love you. I care for you. You're the greatest. And your master is saying, go do one, two, and three. And you just keep repeating, I love you. You're the greatest. I care only for you. Eventually, you know, it's, it's absurd. So this is an important point. That being busy by the Qur'an is all... So th there is a part that when, when a difficulty happens, or, or in general... If you busy yourself with the Qur'an, you'll be under the protection of Allah. But that busying with the Qur'an is not just that difficulties happen. Let's just recite Surah Yaseen. And okay, everything will be facilitated. It's also that when people, and this is mujarrab, this is tried, tested, and true. That if difficulty happens, some challenge occurs, you say, what is Allah calling me to in the Qur'an that I haven't responded to? Of some obligation that I am not fulfilling, some prohibition that I am not leaving, or some disliked matter that I'm still engaged in. And you make the commitment to busy yourself with, with that matter, either in acquiring that which Allah has called you to, or in leaving that which Allah has called you to leave, for his sake. And you will get better than those who busy themselves asking will get. And there is much in the Quran and Sunnah that would support this. مَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَوَضَهُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْ Whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah replaces it with far better than it. Right? And that's also entailed by the hadith of Ibn Abbas, which we looked in the previous collection, which is hadith 19 of the 40 Nawawi, 
and a hadith one should always go back to and reflect upon. And we've encouraged that one should be reviewing the 40 Nawawi, if you're, especially if you're a student of knowledge, but for any Muslim. These are hadiths that the essence of Islam revolves around. One should have a routine once a month to review the 40 Nawawi. At least. Hadith 19, the Prophet ﷺ counseled Ibn Abbas, اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ يَحْفَظْكَ Take care of Allah. Guard Allah. Right? Be mindful of Allah, and Allah will be mindful of you. And that's, but that's the first step. Right? That the i'ta, the granting of Allah, is not just Him giving you what you want. Remain mindful of Allah, and you'll find Him before you. Because the giver is greater than His gift. Allahu Akbar, right? And that is the, the key. That to the extent that you remain busy with, with the book of Allah, what's the first thing you get? The things that you wanted. But the intelligent person re realizes that this is, th these are just what getting what you wanted is just a confirmation of the reality of his giving. But that what you should want is him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whoever is busied by the Qur'an from asking me, right? I grant them better than what I grant those who merely ask. Because busying yourself with the Qur'an, in reality, is busying yourself with Allah. So you'll be given what others get, but the greatest gift of the Qur'an is Ar-Rahman. Which is why it, the, the hadith continues. And the virtue of the superiority of the speech of Allah, glorious and exalted is He, over all other speech, is like the virtue of Allah Himself over His creation. So this is a, a tremendous yeah, encouragement. Right? And part, you know, the way to be busy with the Qur'an is one must establish a daily routine of Qur'an. A daily routine of Quran, and one should set a goal. The the prophetic counsel was, "Iqra al Quran fi shahr." Recite the Quran in a month. And that's recommended. That any common believer they should take that as the least that I want to do in my life is to recite the Quran once a month. That's the least, and you may need to build up to that gradually over some months. So if you're not reciting the Quran, begin with a page or two and then increase and make that a habit for 40 days and once you make it a habit then increase gradually let's say to five pages a day and once you make that a habit for 40 days increase to seven pages or ten pages gradually sustainably make that a habit for 40 days unwaveringly force yourself and once you get make that a habit you know, deliberately go towards this base target of reciting it once a month, you know, right? to recite one juz a day, and make that a regular habit. Right? And of course, there's a qualitative aspect to it as well, and so on, but work on that. And then once you reach a juz a day, consolidate that rigorously, even if it's for a long time. And then increase a juice and a bit, etc. Till if you can get to, to two, two juice a day, that is, you know, the practice. That is the more common practice of the companions. If you look in Imam Nawawi's etiquette with the Quran, on how much the Sahaba used to recite the Quran, one would feel embarrassed and ashamed. Nasarullah al Afiyah. But that's also the way of the scholars who acted upon their knowledge. I heard, I heard from Sheikh Nuh Keller. That his teacher, Sheikh Nuh Ali Salman al Qudat, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, said that Man la yakra juz'aini min al Quran, fala fatwa lahu indi. Whoever doesn't recite two juz of Quran every day has no fatwa in my books. So Sheikh Nuh Keller asked him, How is that, Sayyidi? Because it's not normally one of the conditions for fatwa that you recite two juz of Quran. And because someone doesn't recite that much Quran, 
they haven't come, they haven't yet full realized what it means that wal al-akhiratu khairul lak min al that the next life is better for you than this life and if it, one doesn't know that clearly like realize it then what are you telling people about their deen for nasallahu al afiyah um we'll read the next hadith عن ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الذي ليس في جوفه شيء من القرآن كالبيت الخرب The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Truly the one who does not have within them anything of the Quran is like the ruined house is like the ruined house that that you know you are a form your reality is that that heart within but that the life of the heart is the quran and the ruination of the house of your islam is that you don't have quran within it rahu at-tirmidhi wa qala hadithun hasanun sahih that whoever doesn't have anything of the quran within them is like a ruined house and one works on this and if one hasn't yet acquired proficiency in reciting quran then listen to it actively right? listen to it regularly and follow along and every point of connecting with the quran soundly is a point of going from kharab to i'mar right to building and beautifying and ikmal and perfecting nasr allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Tawfiq, what they see, and tomorrow we're going to look at what will be said to the person of Quran in the hereafter, um, and the that re- how recitation of Quran is of the foremost means of being dutiful to one's parents, just by the act of reciting, um, and that the recitation of the Quran is one of the, the shields from the, the fire. Um, so, and that of the most honored of people are the people of Qur'an. So we'll look at those hadiths um, t- tomorrow, we'll, we'll look briefly, before we pause today, at Ta'lim um, al-Mut'allim, Imam Zarnuji's exposition on the proper manners of seeking knowledge and we we looked at examples of um, the adab and veneration the adab entailed by veneration of you know only touching books of knowledge with in a state of wudu right considering it very serious right and this is of course part of the harms also like you know there, there's sort of this casual culture around knowledge that um you know knowledge is something there's some i've been asked several times that can i retweet while in the toilet okay and what about retweeting if it's something religious okay now, firstly you shouldn't be using digital devices in the toilet you can in the washroom the washroom is not the toilet, right? but there is a sacredness. Say that Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, if someone came to his house and asked him a question related to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi he used to say, "Hold on." He used to go and put on his best clothing, put on perfume, and then go answer, because you are dealing with the inheritance of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And if we would present ourselves before people only in a way that's presentable and this is هذا الإرث nabawi this is the prophetic inheritance and the although there is permission established in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu to talk about knowledge while walking many of the early Muslims dislike that the ulama discuss how, because if you look in the book of knowledge in Sahih al-Bukhari, there are hadiths that would indicate the, on the permission of asking about knowledge or conveying knowledge while walking. But many of the early Muslims disliked it. Why? 
Because the, the key to these adab related to respect is the attitude within the heart. The attitude within the heart. Right? So when that sense of respect and veneration isn't there, then you know, then, then there is harm. Then there is harm. Like, can you say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Yes, you can, as long as it's said with rev reverence and respect. But the, the, but the basis is to make that reverence and respect explicit. Right? And there are sahaba who refer to him as Muhammad right? when talking about him. But it was done with reverence, love, and respect. Right? So that's, that, but that was exceptional. Right? So here too, he mentions other adab related to respect. He says, so we talked about being in, in purity. He says, وَمِنَ التَّعْظِيمِ الْوَاجِبِ أَلَّا يَمُدَّ رِجْلَهُ إِلَى الْكِتَابِ And from here, wajib, he uses it in the linguistic sense. From the required respect. It doesn't mean it's legally wajib. From the required respect is that one not stretch one's feet towards a book. Stretching one's feet towards the qibla is according to the vast majority of the scholars, makruh. There are some, some later Hanafis who held it to be haram, yeah, makruh tahriman. But, but it is makruh, it is contrary to the sunnah. Similarly, it's considered disrespectful to stretch one's feet towards other people in general. right? Unless it is in an informal, relaxed setting. You're just chilling with your siblings or something. Right? But any respectable gathering, one doesn't stretch one's feet directly towards another, but particularly an, someone older, and most especially a person of knowledge, and most especially in a circle of knowledge. Because of, you know, these are degrees of ascription to the sacred. And likewise with a book, likewise with a book, that stretching one's feet towards a book, if it's close to one and at the level of the feet, it is disliked. And if it's close to one and at the level of the feet, if it is away from one or higher than one's feet, then, you know, it's, it's not so grave. But, you know, the, the proper adab is... Now, if books are on a shelf, you can extend your feet towards the, the shelves, but, but don't be right next to the shelf, because your, your feet are directly facing some books. Then one should be away. If one's unable to, the adab is, you know, or someone is to cover one's feet. Sometimes there's some elderly scholars, for example, and we've had that, they've come to the hub, and they had to stretch their feet. The, the adab is, you, know, you, you put like a, a shawl or a blanket or something on the feet, so that, that, and elderly scholars do that with students. They, they have to stretch their feet, they'll put something on you to cover their feet. But this is al adab who ad deen. Adab is religion. And he says, وَلَا يَضَعُوا عَلَى الْكِتَابِ شَيْئًا آخر. One does not put anything else above a book. Right? So if you're, you know, if you put putting things down on your desk, you don't put a sibha on a book. You don't put your phone on a book of knowledge. You don't put your eyeglasses on a book. Because this is prophetic inheritance. Right? This contains the guidance of Allah and His Messenger and what is understood from the guidance of Allah and His Messenger. Whoever venerates the symbols of Allah, truly that is from taqwa in, the, in, in hearts. And from that as well, they say you don't lean against books. You don't lean against books because they're worthy of respect. They're not, <laughs> they're not a, a cushion. And there are some of the Shafi'is who've held that this to be haram, to put something deliberately on top of a book, even a sibha or a pen. Some of them held it to be haram. But it's makru, and especially for someone who is a person of knowledge, this is not befitting. And then he says, وَكَانَ أُسْتَاذِنَا الشَّيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ 
برهان الدين رحمه الله تعالى يحكي عن شيخ من, من المشايخ أن فقيها كان وضع المحبر على الكتاب فقال له بالفارسية something which means لا تجد النفع من علمك do you know how to do you know how to read it it looks like biryani okay so the, the sheikh t- hmm. okay so it, he says that I heard from my my teacher sheikh al-islam burhan al-deen al-marghinani the author of the day that it's related from from some of the scholars that there, there was a faqih who used to place or who had placed his ink pot on top of a book so they said to him in, 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 in Farisi you won't find benefit in your knowledge and that's how it was وَكَانَ أُسْتَاذُنَا الْقَاضِي الْإِمَامَ الْأَجَلْ فَخْرُ الْإِسْلَامَ الْمَعْرُوفِ بِقَاضِ خَانِ so Imam Zarnuji, the author of Ta'alim and Ta'alim, was a student of Imam Al-Marghinani, the author of the Hidayah, and the author of Qadi Khan, whose fatawa, I consider of the greatest fatawa in the Hanafi school, so much so that it was said, of course, it's mubalagha, la yufta bi khilafi Qadi Khan. One does not give fatwa contrary to what Qadi Khan has said. Of course, that's overstatement, but he was, it's, a big, it's like, He's as big a deal as his name, Qadi Khan. It's like, um, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, um, he said, he used to say, إِن لَمْ تُرِدْ بِذَلِكَ الْإِسْتِخْفَافِ فَلَا بَأْسْ فَلَا بَأْسَ بِهِ وَالْأَوْلَى أَنْ and يحترز عنه. He said, if you're not doing it out of disrespect, he said, there's no harm in it. And this expression, la ba's, means no harm in it. Nafyu al ba's wa nafyu al shidda. There's no harm in it. Yufidu khilaf al awla. It indicates that this is contrary to what is better. Wal awla an yahtariz anhu. And it's better to avoid it. And this is in terms of legal ruling. Right? So it's either somewhat disliked or improper. Khilaf al-Awla, it's improper. It's contrary to what is proper. But, um, you know, the expressive respect. Um, another, and, and he'll mention a few other things which we'll look at tomorrow with respect to res- uh, respect, is putting a book on the ground. Any book of knowledge, just putting it on the ground is bad adab. Right? So for example, if one's sitting on the ground in a lesson, etc., if one has a bag or something, one puts a book on the bag. Right? If one's going to pray and has a notebook, the adab is put the notebook against a windowsill. If you can't find anywhere to put it, you put the book, lean the book against the wall vertically. And that's better. That is a res- that's, uh, what I've seen from, from respected mashayikh is that if they saw someone put a book on the ground, they'd go, even if, and pick it up and put it on the side. Right? Some, you know, because this is this ta'zim you know, is, is, is wajib. And there is some leeway for some people. I asked Sheikh, Sheikh Salik about this. Because once I went to visit Sheikh Salik bin Siddina, the Mauritanian scholar in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he said, there's a big mushkila that's happening. I said, why? He said, these Afghani guys, they came today. He has a lot of Afghani. And they put all my books on the shelves. Musib. This Sheikh Salik. You know, he's a man of the desert. Now, they don't have shelves there. Or hardly. So he'd keep his books on the ground. But the adab is, you don't just leave one book on the ground. If you pile books up on the ground, then it's not contrary to adab. But the general adab is that when you are able to comfortably put something up, right, then you don't leave it down. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us true ta'zeem, both the inward ta'zeem, the inward respect and its outward expression because the inward and the outward go together wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad an nabi al muazzam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin thank you for listening to the rauha daily guidance for seekers with sheikh faraz rabbani 
Help Seekers Hub give light to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.